scripture reading comes from the Hebrew Bible, Genesis, verse here, chapter 32. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children, and crossed the fort of the Jebel. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go, unless you bless me. And so he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans, and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. The reading of the Gospel is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowd away, so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and two fish. And he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and all eight were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the word of God. So you don't know that first hymn we sang. <laughs> I chose that hymn because of the third verse. Uh, on the night, uh, uh, did not Jesus, I'm not quite sure the exact word, pray a song that night in which evil strove against the light. And um, I, I, I thought about that when, when I read the gospel lesson because um, the lesson begins after he heard this. And what he heard was that his cousin, John, was uh, murdered, uh, brutally murdered, assassinated, if you will, by Herod. Um, you all know that story. It's, 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 it's fleshed out in the sixth chapter of Mark, if you want to read more about that. But um, clearly, I think Jesus must have been shaken by that, that news because that, that, that very brutal death was was like a precursor to what was coming for him. And evidently the disciples must have picked this up because uh, for once they were doing something really pretty cool and pastoral and kind. They, they wanted to sort of care for him and get him to step out. Um, but obviously uh, the crowd heard about this news too and they were disturbed by it. Because, you know, John the Baptist would have probably been equivalent to what a rock star would be for today, you know. Uh, he was quite a character and managed to draw a crowd wherever he was. And uh, people were endeared to him. And so when they heard the news, they went to Jesus. And so you had all these, this, this sort of brokenness thing. And... Uh, the disciples probably quite accurately read Jesus' concern, the suggestion that we go to a quiet place. But uh, Jesus overruled them and decided to um, care for the crowd in their grief. There are a lot of things in life that wound our soul. 
And some of those things can wound our soul at a very deep, deep level. So deeply wounded that as we begin to live beyond the wounding, that wound begins to shape so much of what we do and how we respond to things. How we might handle certain things. There have been episodes in my own ministry where uh, I, 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 I had to deal with maybe a, a, an individual that was creating lots of problems in the congregation and then when I found out the soul wound. Oh, that is amazing. It completely changes the way I try to work with that person. And so here uh, we get a sense that uh, at a deep level in Jesus' ministry, he is wounded by some very bad news. Some very bad news. We see in the psalm this morning, uh, the psalmist uh, basically putting God on notice that he's got something going on within himself and he wants it fixed. And I love the way Peterson translates that psalm because there's a directness in it. But there's a soul wound here. And the psalmist has finally decided the only way he's going to get at it is to go one-on-one -on -one with Yahweh. And of course, in the Old Testament lesson, we have Jacob, who was wounded at a very, very young age by a father who preferred Jacob's brother. And no matter what Jacob could do, he could never impress Isaac, his father, because Isaac was so impressed with Esau, who was very manly and very airy and very strong, but not the brightest bulb on the shelf. Where Jacob was sort of small and um, not so hairy, but boy, oh boy, was he smart as well. And so as this dysfunction between the relationship between Isaac and Jacob grows, this wound within Jacob, or within Jacob grows. And it gets nurtured by Rebecca, Jacob's mother, Isaac's wife. Because for whatever reason, Rebecca favors Jacob over Esau. So we've got all sorts of family dysfunction going on here. And this favoritism that was shared by each parent for each child allows this wound within Jacob's soul to be nurtured and fed until Jacob gets to the point where he believes he's owed something. And he will do whatever it takes, ethical or not ethical, to get what he wants. And so he ends up, you all know the story, cheating Esau out of Esau's birthright to be the leader of the Hebrew people. After Isaac passes. And when Esau finally figures out what had happened, he goes after Jacob and says, Esau's bigger. Jacob takes off, and he goes to another land, and there he meets Laban, and Laban puts him to work, and he falls in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel, but Laban has an older daughter named Leah, and so Laban says, if you work for me for seven years, I'll let you marry Rachel. And then after seven years, he goes to Laban, and I have Rachel's hand in marriage, and so what Laban does is he pulls a switch, and he sneaks Leah to stand by Jacob. And then Jacob finds out he's been tricked. But he loves Rachel so much, 
he agrees to another seven years. He finally wins Rachel's hand and he decides he wants out of the arrangement with his father-in-law and so he manages to trick Laban. And now he's got all this wealth and his wife and his kids and everything and he needs to do something with it. And he wants to go home. But he feels like he can't because there's this thing with Esau. And he grows weary of the life that he's been living because he now has everything he wants but a place to live. And in this crisis, Jacob comes in direct confrontation with this wounding. And he realizes that if he's ever going to have a home again, he has to do something about this soul wound that has been placed deeply within him and been nurtured not only by his own feelings of rejection, but by his mother's treachery. And so one night he sends his entire family away. And like the psalmist, he stands there, ready to pick a fight with Yahweh. And they fight all night. And Jacob is so impassioned about overcoming this soul wound. He persists on fighting into the day. And Yahweh won't do that. Won't do that. There are rules. One of the rules is you can't see Yahweh. And if you fought into the day, Jacob would be able to see him. And then Yahweh would have to kill him. Because that violates the rules. Now, this Old Testament stuff is sort of archaic, but it's sort of wonderfully archaic, you know. And um, so Yahweh tells Jacob to stop. And Jacob says, I'm not going anywhere until this issue is resolved. And he feels the only way this issue, this soul wound, is going to find any healing is if Yahweh would bless him. Because if Yahweh blesses him, then this blessing would come from God. And he did nothing to cheat or chisel it out of anybody like he got the blessing from his father. Cheating. And it would be authentic. And it would be real. And so he could go home and try to reconcile with his brother. And Yahweh repents, blesses him. So Jacob gets what he wants. But Yahweh expects something in return. Healing is painful. The process of healing is painful. It does not leave us unchanged. And so Yahweh touches Jacob's hip. And for the rest of Jacob's life, he will have a limp. And he will remember the pain that was necessary to get to the healing he wanted. We have to wrestle with the darker sides of our soul. 
And if we don't, those darker sides will play havoc with how we live our lives. And often we will not even be aware of it. I remember one day I got real testy and real angry with the funeral director in my church setting up for a funeral. And before you know it, I was just all over him. And after it was done, I walked away and I'm going, gee, my blade, where did that come from? <laughs> it happened to be the very same day that I got a phone call from hospice telling me that um, they're going to take over care for my mother in her last days. And I had to be in Columbus in two hours. And I told them there was no way I could be in Columbus in two hours. So I know exactly where it all came from. My grief. My frustration. My anger. The wounding of my soul as I struggled with my mother's dying. We have to own these wounds. And be willing to wrestle with Let's get back to the gospel lesson. Jesus just hears news of this horrible death of his cousin. He is heartbroken. The disciples want to take him away and care for him. The crowd hears this horrible news of one of their heroes. They come out to seek comfort and support and care. Jesus is caught in the middle of this. His own pain and sorrow. His need to do what he's called to do. Care for the crowd. His response is to break bread. with everybody. To feed. To care. To love. Jesus has a different way of wrestling with Yahweh. But he wrestles just the same. And in the breaking of the bread, in the sharing of the cup. <coughs> Everyone gets fed the healing grace. So whether or not we be able to wrestle all night with Yahweh over the wounds that have deeply scarred our soul, or to gather together around a simple, quiet ritual, of sharing bread and cup. It is God's intent to heal. It is God's intent to reconcile. It is God's intent to make well. to get to where Jacob is. And we've got to get where the psalmist is. And we've even got to get to where Jesus is. And own the pain we carry. Before the hip could be touched. The load broke. Know the 
that you are loved.